evening, everyone. I'm going to just uh, prompt the musician here. So I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight to the South Peace Community Art Council second concert of their Home Roots series. We are excited to have Ken Tizard, a songwriter from Ontario who is only has a successful solo career, but he also forms with the Watchmen. Let's give him a warm welcome. Have you seen the Watchmen? Yeah, yeah. Leopard at the university. <laughs> were you there with them too? I would have been, yes. Oh, they were throwing pizza over the crowd. Thank you. Some sort of basketball it was, uh, those were crazy days, those were crazy days. We still do, we still do about five shows a year, which is fun. Sorry, I was caught up in a conversation back there. I lost track of time. I should have been up here five minutes ago. How's everybody doing tonight? Excellent. Um, my name is Ken Tizard. I'm trying to be very cautious of the artwork here as I get prepared. I'm from St. John's, Newfoundland. Has anybody ever been back home, or what I call home, St. John's? No? One person? You were in St. John's once? Did you enjoy yourself? <laughs> Not as much as you do, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love going back. I was just back last weekend, actually. I had the, the band back for the new record that I'm sort of out promoting now, and um, it comes out on November 6th. The album is called A Good Dog Is Lost. Um, which is a song title um, from a uh, Newfoundland singer-songwriter named Ron Hines. You'll learn a lot about Ron Hines tonight. He was a dear friend of mine. I played bass with him for the last few years that um, he was touring. And um, I'll get into all that story later on. But if you're ever in St. John's, Newfoundland, you happen to have the luxury of taking a taxi cab. Uh, Bugden's Jiffy and, and uh, Gulliver's were the three that were around when I was growing up. There's a few other ones now. But uh, Newfoundlanders tend to be a chatty bunch, um, and uh, if you happen to strike up a conversation with the taxi driver, you will hear all kinds of information, starting with their name and their family name, and probably some family relative that owns a big plumbing company or something that you've seen advertisements for, um, all this sort of small town local stuff. And then they'll talk to you about some political thing or something that's been happening in the news. And then as they drop you off, they'll wrap it all up by uh, by reintroducing themselves and sending you on your way. Ron Hines wrote a song years ago called Killer Cab, and I love the way the, uh, the song is arranged. It's arranged, uh, it's a song about a taxi driver, but it's arranged the same way that you would get a taxi ride. It starts with an introduction and ends with an introduction, and in the middle is a story. And uh, I'm gonna start the night with that one there, if that's all right with y'all. It's a song called Killer Cab. Since 1954, wore out ten or a dozen cars over 30 years or more. Drove the other side of midnight to the clear edge of dawn. Seen a whole lot of what wasn't right and even more of what was. Man jumps in my cab one night I'm sitting at the stand Slumps down in the back seat With his face down in his hands I mumbled out of town address Was his only remark Till we're halfway out the highway And he speaks up from the dark I can find no comfort in this night Friend, I believe I might have taken someone's life I remember screaming I remember the front door slam But I can't recall how I got all these stains upon my hands Drop him at this dirty shack He's the picture of despair I 
Can't remember what the meter read or if he even paid the fare. All I recall is a sweet relief. I was halfway back to town when a police cruiser with a flashing light was flagging me down. He said, Where'd you take that last fare, mister? There are times I hear him whisper in the night Friend, I believe I might have taken someone's life I remember screaming I remember the front door slam I can't recall how I got all these stains upon my hands I taxied up and down this town since 1954 Wore out ten or a dozen cars over 30 years or more Drove the other side of midnight to clear it Seen a whole lot of what wasn't right and even more of what was wrong. Even more of what was wrong. Even more of what was wrong. turn of the century there was a lot of work happening down in New York they were building all the all the buildings and they needed steel and concrete workers and um, Newfoundlanders uh, back then were uh, were always up for some work and some travel and a lot of the uh, you know the Brooklyn Bridge and uh, Empire State Building and those buildings a lot of those buildings and, and structures were put together by Newfoundlanders and uh, Ron wrote a little song that was inspired by that when I was putting this record together, I was looking for some uh, interesting ways to, um, to recapture Ron's songs, and, and Ron had uh, recorded this song a cappella. But when I was researching some archival footage, I found an old, uh, he was doing a workshop at a folk seminar, um, one of the conferences, I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, he was working on this song, and he was putting it together, and he was strumming an acoustic guitar when he was singing it. So I, I lifted that and, and put the band around it and recorded a little bit of a different version. <laughs> This is a song called For the USA. It goes like this. With the 20th century still in bloom In fair conception bay The world turned round and men were bound All for the USA All for the USA To the streets of a New York town They poured like morning tide To raise the concrete and the steel Up to the New York sky Up to the New York sky well, Can you read and write? Can you drink and fight? Can you take the nights alone? You can make a life for a child and a wife While far away from home while far away from home You can tip your hat to a Chelsea girl She'll free you from the cold She'll lend a tender loving ear To every story told To every story told well, Have you got the hands? Have you got the hearts? Have you got the cold steel nerve? You can rant and roar on a New York floor and you'll get what you deserve. You'll get what you deserve. There's them old fold and them old freeze and crawl home in dismay and curse the hand of God above and break right down and pray. They'll break right down and pray. Still in bloom in fair conception bay. The world turned round and men were bound. All 
for the USA, all for the USA. Oh, thank you. It takes me a couple songs. These, these house concert things are a peculiar entity. Um, I, I, and I really appreciate the communities that, that keep them alive because it's, it's a great opportunity as a singer-songwriter to get to tell the stories behind where everything comes from. Um, you know, usually for a lot of years I played with a rock and roll band and, you know, it was all about the mystery. You know, like you couldn't be seen before the show. You had to stay on the tour bus and, you know, you got escorted by security from the tour bus to the backstage area. And then you waited until the lights come down and all of a sudden the lights came up and there you were and everybody got to see you for 90 minutes and then the lights went down and you were gone again and you vanished. You know, that was the big mystery of rock and roll that we all lived by for years. Um, I was never a particularly big fan of it. I always found a way to sneak out to the crowd and hang out with the people that were actually paying to, you know, keep us alive. I always thought that was important. Um, Nowadays, I do have a band that I tour with as well. I've got a guy who plays fiddle and mandolin and banjo. I've got another guitar player, uh, a bass player, and a drummer, and a few other people that join me from time to time. And those shows are nice too, but it's usually sort of, you know, in a room with 100 or 150 people, and you kind of keep it upbeat, and you keep the, you know, what you say about the songs pretty short in between. But I just love coming up and doing these things, because, you know, it gives me a chance to talk about everything, and I like to talk. <laughs> but it takes me a couple songs, you know, I, I, sit, I sit back in the corner over there, I'm watching people saunter in, and I'm thinking, oh, we've got the big harvest thing happening tonight. What's that called? The, uh, is it Octoberfest? 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 we got Octoberfest, and then the singers, the songwriters, something or other is happening somewhere else, too, and I'm like, oh, is anybody going to show up? And <laughs> in the mind, in the back of my mind, I hear some sort of old people that, um, some of my old mentors who used to say to me, you know, if you got enough people for, uh, you know, for a game of cards, you got enough people for a concert. So, you know, and, and these things are in my mind too. But it's, it always takes me a minute to get out, and then I sort of see everybody, and you're really close, and there's, there's no smoke and mirrors here. It's just me and a guitar. And I got to tell my stories, and I had a six-hour drive today. And anyway, so I'm on to song three, and I'm pretty much familiar with all your faces now. So now from here on in, it's going to get easier for me. So I'm just, I'm just letting you in on everything. Where were you driving? Did you drive in from? I drove in from Hinton which uh, it was a beautiful drive today. And it actually didn't take me as long as I thought. <laughs> and uh, the scenery made up for it. My goodness, what a beautiful part of the world it is out here. I've seen it from the tour bus many times, but I, I don't get a chance to drive. And when you're by yourself, you can pull over too. You know, I say, oh, that's a nice little lake. I love the way the reflection's hitting the water right now. And you pull over and sit there for two minutes and go, this is awesome. And you get back in the car and go find another one. So, continuing with the Ron songs. I had, been, I had moved away from, uh, from Newfoundland, and I was in Ontario, and I, I ran into Ron in a restaurant, and uh, he was playing a little theater show down the road from where I lived. So I, uh, I said, well, I better go check Ron out. I haven't seen him in years, and I happened to be home, which was lovely. Um, so I dropped by the show, and, uh, and during the show, Ron, Ron made a, made a dedication to me. You know, he started talking about, oh, you know, young whippersnapper Ken Tizzard's in the audience tonight. He's a Newfoundlander and he lives here in your community. And he started telling everybody about me. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Ron's talking about me. And, you know, he was my idol uh, growing up in Newfoundland. And, uh, and he kept talking about he was going to dedicate a song to me. He was going to dedicate a song to me. And I was so proud of myself. And then finally, uh, you know, he, he got to the end of his speech and he said, yeah, so this one goes out to Ken Tizzard tonight and it's a song called The Man of a Thousand Songs, which is one of Ron's trademark songs. He was known as The Man of a Thousand Songs. He had a song called The Man of a Thousand Songs and there's a documentary called The Man of a Thousand Songs about Ron. The story of The Man of a Thousand Songs is a sort of a drug-addicted musician who keeps playing night after night, going from town to town, playing for wherever they can, trying to make a living. And uh, when, he, when he introduced that and dedicated it to me, I thought it was kind of funny, because uh, well, there's lots of reasons that that's funny. <laughs> He's got a crimson red tattoo, keeps it hidden just above his t-shirt sleeve. It's a broken heart and the inscription reads, no love songs if you please. But he don't really mean that, it's his only cheeky tongue. He stands up and sings for them every night, he's the man of a thousand songs. He knows the streets like he knows his last name. 
He knows the city from the wrong side out. He knows the time is cruel and any man's a fool who hides the truth behind his mouth. He knows the Duke of Earl. He knows my girl in the house of the rising sun. And the opening line on his marquee sign reads the man of a thousand songs. He knows an old hotel with a desk clerk will sell you your soul back reasonably cheap. Or oh, this guy you can call when you crawl in a wall and the whole town's asleep. He don't promise what he don't deliver. He keeps it all in the easy keys. He don't dream beyond his expectations. But he's got the stance down to a T. He's got a friend in the backstage alley Got just a thing to make the night move along He's taking all requests like you might have guessed He's the man of a thousand songs well, He knows an old hotel With a desk clerk to sell you your soul back Reasonably cheap Or this guy you can call when you crawl in a wall in the Town's asleep, he don't promise what he don't deliver. He keeps it all in the easy keys. He don't dream yet his expectations, but he's got the stance down to a T. He's got a friend in the backstage alley, got just a thing to make the night move along. He's taking all requests like you might have guessed. He's the man. some good. I don't know who made that, but they know what they're doing. <laughs> well, when I was a teenager, what's that? <laughs> when I was a teenager, I was, um, I was in punk rock music. I played in a punk rock band, and um, in the late 70s, early 80s, if you were into punk rock, you were probably into skateboarding as well. And uh, you're looking at the 1983 Newfoundland and Labrador skateboard champion right here. <laughs> yep, we didn't do much back then, but uh, somehow I managed to win a competition that was held. And um, St. John's is like a bowl, you know. Uh, and in the bottom of the basin is this little piece of water, and there's a little place you can get in through the crags and the rocks. And then the city builds up around it like that. And then it comes out, and then it flattens out, and then it goes down again. There's a few more dips. But the whole of St. John's started in this little tiny harbor and built up from there. And I lived sort of up on the top here. My buddy Clark lived on the top over here. And almost every day, uh, we'd skateboard and we'd, we'd make our way downtown slowly. By, by midday, we'd be downtown. And then we'd have to figure out what to do from there, because it was all uphill once you get down there. And one of the most beautiful things about downtown St. John's when I was growing up was that the harbor had flat concrete all around us. You could go out on the dock and there was this big, huge piece of flat concrete and you could skateboard down. And this would have been, the, like I said, the late 70s, early 80s. We probably had three channels on the TV still, if I remember. I think we'd graduated to a color TV. Uh, I know we'd graduated from a party line at the house, so we had, you know, the telephone we actually was dedicated to our house. We weren't sharing with the neighbors anymore, and that was nice. Um, but there was no internet. There was no, uh, not a lot of bookstores. There wasn't a lot of exposure to the outside world. You know, it was potatoes and turnips and carrots and cabbage. And on the fruit side, it was apples and oranges and a banana, if you were lucky. Um, and I didn't know much of the outside world at all. But when I was skateboarding down on the dock in St. John's, Newfoundland, I would meet fishermen from around the world, primarily um, the Russians, the Portuguese, and the French. And me and my buddies would be down there skateboarding, and they'd come out in the day, and they'd, you know, we'd trade cigarettes with them. They'd give us one of those sort of terrible uh, Russian cigarettes, and we'd give them one of our, you know, export A. And uh, we'd end off chatting, and sometimes they'd take us on the ships, and they'd give us a little tour, and we got to see how everything worked. And 
occasionally they'd give us a little bit of salt fish that they had cured for their trip. And you know, I, I remember one time, me and my buddy Clark got uh, got on one of the ships, and the guy had given us a, a full flake of, hal of halibut, this big triangular piece that was cut in half. I remember skating, skateboarding home across St. John's, carrying this big piece of salt fish. My dad was happy as anything when I got home with it, though, because that was hard to come by. But that was my only exposure to the rest of the world, and, and learn, you know, hearing people speak in different languages and talk about what it was like in different parts of the world. That was the only exposure I had. You know, we had an encyclopedia set at the house, but you know, that, was, uh, that was barely opened. A few years back, I went home for a visit, and my buddy Clark, uh, me and him are still good friends, and he always picks me up at the airport, and we go for a drive. We go down through Kitty Vitty, and we go up Signal Hill, and we do all the sort of sights. And when we got down to the harbor, we turned the corner, and there was this huge chain link fence going the whole length of the harbor. Um, they were going through some security issues, trying to figure out, you know, being an international port, if it's, if you're allowed to be on the harbor and all that, and they decided that you know you weren't allowed to go out on the harbor anymore as a as a pedestrian. So they had this massive chain link fence, and it was ugly, you know, the ugly gray chain link fences, and it was taller than me. I mean, it had to be eight foot, and it went on for the whole length of the harbor. And I remember being very disappointed by that and pretty angry about it too. And I thought, oh, I'm going to write a big protest song about this, and and I realized I was too old for angry protest songs. Um, <laughs> And I twisted, the whole time I was home, I twisted and turned with this, you know, I went down to Kitty Vitty, which was, uh, you know, they call it the gut, which is another part of uh, town, and, and it's where they, they used to have the old sort of, um, the old stages and the old fishermen's uh, huts that were on stilts in the water. And they were being torn down, and there was new houses going up, and new development, and the church that I used to go to had been turned into condominiums. And this trip just really left me with a, with a terrible sort of feeling of everything was changing that, that I had known. And when I started writing, that was sort of my, my initial intention, was sort of anger and sadness. And um, as I wrote this song that I'm going to play for you now, it sort of morphed more into a, um, a reflection on how nice it was to grow up in St. John's when I did grow up there, and, um, and how lucky I was as a child to have the experiences that I did. This is a song that's off my uh, second last record called No Dark, No Light. This song is called Home. It goes like this. City Harbor lies behind the chain link fence You can see it from a distance You can even feel the wind But you can't walk out on that dock And stand beside the sea-torn freighters Sense those stories of the lives that live within You can't have it the way it was have to take it as it is Those times have changed, those days are gone and Those days are past but not forgot You can't stop the winds of change Forever in your mind self-same Oh, don't be sad We were blessed for what we had And those days are gone The memories cast in stone And I know I'm not alone And it chills me to the bone North, who'd ever blame to fight against this hurt, change, and wait and game? How many words can twist and burn like spark to hay? No further down, no further down this hurting old time road will stray. You can't have it the way it was, have to take it as it is. Those times have changed, those days are gone. Those days have passed, but not forgotten. You can't stop the winds of change forever in your mind, self same. Blessed for what we had. Those days are gone. The memories cast in stone, and I know I'm not alone. And it chills me to the bone in this place called home. You can't lose what you don't know. The deepest ties you'll ever know. Hurt so bad to let you go And I thought that I just came to say hello to this place called home oh. 
City Harbor lies behind the chain link fence. You can see it from a distance. You can even feel the wind. Thank you very much. I'm going to preface this next song with this will be the longest story of the night, but it's an important story. This story will help you to understand a little bit of why my new record is a dedication to my friend Ron Hines. So this story takes a little bit of time, so I'll get through it here. As I mentioned, when I was growing up, I had a TV with three channels on it. It was black and white when I was watching it, and it was sat in the kitchen, and we would watch TV during dinner. And it would always be The Price is Right, Gilligan's Island, or Three's Company. That was, uh, that was the three choices of dinner. And uh, depending on the day of the week, was what we got. And that's sort of all I remember about television until the show came on. And it came on pretty regularly, and then more regularly. It became really popular. And it was called The Wonderful Grand Band, or the WGB, which was a Newfoundland phenomenon. The Wonderful Grand Band started with uh, Tommy Sexton and Greg Malone. Um, inevitably, Kathy Jones, who some of you may know from 22 Minutes and stuff, got in on it. Um, and it was a comedy show. It was a half-hour comedy show on television. And they also had music. And there was the wonderful grand band, and they wrote sort of satirical, funny Newfoundland songs um, between the, the skits. And this was on television. And it became massively huge. Um, you know, they used to say that if the Beatles were playing at the stadium and the wonderful grand band were playing at the park across, the park would be full and the stadium would be empty. It was that type of phenomenon in Newfoundland. Everybody loved the wonderful grand band. So when I was really young, the first music that I had seen from Newfoundlanders and stuff that I could relate to was the wonderful grand band. And the singer of the wonderful grand band was a young man named Ron Hines. As I grew up, I followed Ron's career. He was a famous Newfoundland guy, and you know, I was growing up. And when I was sort of a teenager and realized I wanted to do music, he sort of worked his way up to be on my list of people to admire and respect. When I was 17, maybe 16, late 16, early 17, I moved out of my family house and moved in with my girlfriend. And her parents, um, her parents were good friends with Ron and Connie Hines. So once a week, or you know, once or twice a month, I'd end up having dinner and uh, Ron Hines would be sitting across the table from me. And I was a young punk, playing in punk bands and doing all my stuff, and you know, Ron was this sort of famous Newfoundland singer. And um, we didn't have much of a relationship other than we knew each other, but it was exciting for me to get to know this gentleman. <coughs> Years go by, I left Newfoundland. Uh, Ron continued his career as a singer-songwriter. Um, I moved to Toronto, joined a band, started touring, spent 25 years doing 280 shows a year. Um, occasionally, I'd be in an airport and I'd look across and I'd see the hat. You know, Ron had a hat that he wore. And I'd see the hat and I'd think, geez, that's got to be Ron over there. And I'd walk over, Ron, and sure enough, it was Ron. And hey, Ken, how you doing? And we'd have a little catch up and a little chat. And that was all great. So we kind of stayed in touch, but we weren't ever close. <clears throat> and about eight years ago, Ron had been battling cancer. I'd been hearing about it. Um, and about eight years ago, I got a text from Ron saying, uh, Ken, would you want to come down to Newfoundland and do 12 Arts and Culture Center shows with me? Now, the Arts and Culture Center in Newfoundland are sort of thousand-seat theaters, and they're all across Newfoundland. There's uh, maybe 15 of them, Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, when I left Newfoundland, it still does Newfoundland, but now it's Newfoundland and Labrador. And I always got to remember to say that, to be politically correct. <laughs> So he said, do you want to come down and do these shows with me? It's my, my comeback to the stage after, you know, he had just gone through radiation on his throat and part of his tongue removed and all this crazy stuff. And he said, I got 12 shows. Um, do you want to come down and do them? And I, it was a text. And I texted him back. I said, absolutely. That, you know, that'd be fantastic. Uh, he said, okay. So it starts November 1st. Uh, this was in September. He texted me. He said, it starts on November 1st. Here's my manager's name and number. Give him a call. So I immediately called this guy, Charles McPhail. And uh, he answered the phone. I said, hey, Charlie, this is uh, Ken Tizard. I'm from Newfoundland. I live in Ontario. But Ron Hines has hired me to do this tour in November. And Charlie said to me, he said, uh, he said no, boy, I don't know nothing about that. I said, well, Ron's hired me to do the shows. There's 12 of them. He said, yeah, he's got 12 shows, but you're not doing them. I said, come on. I said, I need some information on it. He said, no, boy, you're not, I don't know anything about it. You're not doing it. I said, OK, well, that's fine. So I got off the phone. I thought, that was weird. A couple hours later, the phone rang, and it was Charlie. He said, 
yeah, so uh, you're doing these shows with Ron, right? <laughs> I said, okay, you've been talking to Ron. He said, yeah. I said, okay, that's fantastic. I said, uh, I need some information. I said, I need to know sort of, you know, what equipment to bring, you know, is it a small combo or a midsize or a big rig? And, uh, you know, what are we dressing? You know, is it suit and tie? You know, this is kind of a formal affair. Or is it, you know, sort of jeans and t-shirt? And I said, and I also, I said, most importantly, I need to know what songs Ron is playing these days. And he just, uh, there was a moment of silence on the phone, and he said, sure, man, I, I, I don't got none of that information. I said, well, you're Ron's manager, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, Ron told me to call you for the details. He said, he said I don't know, why it's Ron? Ron does what he wants to do. I, I, I got no idea. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, I said, I'll give Ron a call. He said, no, don't call Ron, boy. He said, Ron's texting these days. He doesn't like to talk. I said, okay, well. And, and all the years that I've been kind of following Ron out of the peripheral vision of, of what's happening back home, I was hearing all these crazy stories about him. You know, he, 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 he had drug addiction issues and he, he battled with that for most of his life and, and he, had a real, he had a real persona of being, you know, dark and light. He could be the most loving guy that you'd ever met, but he could also be the, the hardest guy to work with in the world. And I was sort of experiencing the, the hardest guy to work with in the world <laughs> feeling at this point. <laughs> So me and Charlie went back and forth for a while, and, and finally he said, look, he said, the first show's on Friday night, so why don't you come in Monday, you'll have a week of rehearsals, it'll all be great. And I said, okay. Meanwhile, I'm pretty nervous, because I'm going to get the chance to play with the, you know, Newfoundland legend. Uh, you know, if you go down on George Street in Newfoundland, which is the big drinking street with all the bars, there's a big bronze statue of him in, in the middle of the street with his, you know, holding his old uh, J200 guitar. So I was pretty nervous, but I, I, I managed to find 130 Ron songs recorded, and I made charts for all of them, and I had them in this black leather binder, everything alphabetized and little tabs around so I could get to songs quick. So I went down on Monday, no rehearsal, no phone call. Tuesday rehearsal, found out it was canceled. But then Tuesday lunchtime, I get a text from Ron, it says, pick me up at the Delta, we'll go have lunch. I said, excellent, I'm gonna figure out what's going on now. So I go down and I pick Ron up at the Delta, and he gets in the car, and, and we go, down, we go down to a little restaurant called uh, uh, Names of the Rocket, sorry, Rocket Bakery, which is a fantastic place for lunch if you're ever in St. John's. And we walk in, and, and the layout of the room is similar to this, a little bit longer, but you walk to the end, and the lineup comes back out to the front, and then you go grab your table after you've ordered your food and picked it up. But Ron bypassed all that because, you know, he's Ron Hines, he's the king of Newfoundland. So he just walked in, he looked behind the counter, and he said, two bowls of chowder, two orders of fish cakes, two coffees, and two waters. And then he walked off to a table, and I was just standing there going, yeah, I guess that's what I'm having, so I followed Ron. <laughs> and we got over, and Ron opened his little bag that he carried over his shoulder, and he pulled out a newspaper, and he opened up the newspaper full size, you know, this big, between the two of us. And for 30 minutes, we sat there and ate our lunch, and I stared at the grocery specials while Ron read the newspaper. No conversation at all. And then uh, he folds up his newspaper, and he says, yeah, that was a good lunch, I'm done now, so uh, why don't you run me back up to the hotel? I said, sure, that's, that's not a problem. I said, but we're going to talk about the tour and the show and what's going on. He said, no. Why? I said, what do, what do you need to know? I said, I don't know. Like, what are we playing? <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, well, he said, we'll, we'll get to all that. Don't worry. He said, one thing, though, I forgot how tall you are. So I'm going to want you three feet over to my right and five feet back sitting down. <laughs> and I said, OK. And that's a bit of a weird request, but that's fine. Um, and that was the only information he gave me. And he said, uh, he said, we'll have a rehearsal, a rehearsal Wednesday night, come down to the Delta. So I arrive at the Delta, and I go down to the conference room for a rehearsal, and uh, Ron shows up an hour late. Um, I find out that there is no band, it's just me and Ron. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm, we're doing thousand seat theaters. Um, I'm playing with the man of a thousand songs who has a massive repertoire. He won't tell me what we're playing, and I have to be sitting in a position where I can't possibly see his left hand to follow what he's doing. Um, and I'm playing bass for him. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the layout of music, but if you make a mistake playing bass for a songwriter, it's incredibly apparent. <laughs> Everybody knows it if you make a mistake. So my level of nerves was going through the roof. But we had this Wednesday night rehearsal. We get halfway through one song and Ron stops. And he puts his guitar in his case and he closes the case. I said, what are you doing? He said, that's it, boy. I friggin' hate rehearsing. <laughs> I, said, I said, we did half a song, Ron. He said, yeah, you played that half all right. 
I said, Ron, come on, man, you gotta give me something here. He said, nah. He said, well, well Friday night will be fine. He said, I wouldn't have hired you if I didn't think you could do this. I said, I, I appreciate the vote of confidence, man, but like, really, this is, he said, don't worry about it. And he went on. So Friday night, we're, um, <laughs> we're just 10 minutes from, uh, from going on stage. I think it was in Marystown was the first show. And this is Ron's return to stage. Like Newfoundland has rallied behind him. When Ron got cancer, there was fundraisers at the stadium. Every band played. They raised all this money to help him get through it. Um, the whole of Newfoundland was behind him. And, um, and this was his return to stage after that. And uh, I was, I'd never been so nervous in my life. You know, I'd been all across the world playing for, you know, some shows I played for up to 60 or 70,000 people at some big, comp big festivals and stuff. I've been on TV, I've done the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, all these crazy things. And I'd never been as nervous as I was going on stage with Ron Hines. So he comes into the dressing room about 10 minutes before showtime and he says, uh, what do you got in that book of yours there? And I said, well, and I opened it up and there was 130 songs written out and they were all alphabetized and they were all numbered and they were all color coded. And he just looked at you and went, Jesus, he said, I've never seen anybody do anything like that. And I said, well, I said, here it is. I said, what do you want to do? And he went, okay, well, tonight we're going to do do that one, and that one, and that one. What key did you learn that one in? I said, well, you, you recorded that in E flat. He went, hmm, I don't do it in E flat anymore. <laughs> he said, did you learn all these songs the way I recorded them? I said, I learned them the way you recorded them in the keys you recorded them. He went, I really don't do them like that anymore, and I don't do them in the same keys either. And I said, okay, I'm getting more and more nervous all the time. I said, Ron, I said, what's the first song? I said, let me get out and get comfortable. Like I told you, tonight it takes me a couple songs to get comfortable and then it's fine. I said, what do I, I said, I need one song just to get comfortable. He said, well, he said, why don't we start with House? And I said, House is a great song, I love it. Uh, House is off an album called Stealing Genius, which is a great place to start your Ryan Hines exploration if you feel like it. I said, House, I said, okay, what key do you want to do it in? He said, what key did I record it in? I said, you recorded House in D. He said, okay, we'll do House in D. He said, will that help you get, get comfortable? I said, yeah, absolutely. He said, okay. So we walk to the side of the stage, the house lights go down, standing ovation, everybody's applauding, everybody's teary-eyed in the audience, you know, it's, it's a crazy emotional time. And we walk out and Ron stands in front of the audience and says, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And he turns back to me and he says, house in D, right? I went, yeah, house in D. And he winked at me and he turned around and I'm thinking, this is gonna be great. And he started playing and I went, that's not house. <laughs> and halfway through the first, court, first verse I went, He's playing 1962 in the key of C. <laughs> and I realized at that moment that Ron Hines was going to make my life hell for the next 12 shows. Um, and that was the way he worked. Now, I'd been at that point playing music for over 25 years. And I can tell you in the three weeks that that tour, well, a little over two weeks that that tour happened, I learned more about how to listen to another musician than I'd learned in my entire history. And I used to pride myself on being the guy in the band who listens to everybody else, because I think that the person who listens is the most important member of a band, because you're the one who's not getting in the way of everything. But working with Ron was one of the hardest things I've ever done. But he knew I could do it, and he had faith in me, and it helped me become a better person and a better musician, and we inevitably became very, very close friends. And uh, I worked with him for you know the better part of a couple years after that, until he died. Um, and I'm going to play for you right now the first song I ever played with Ron. This is a song called 1962. It goes like this. I dreamed it was 1962. I dropped a quarter in the jukebox and I played a song for you. I kissed you by the pinball king. We were listening to Del Shannon sing And I had all his records He was my favorite then And that's all gone It won't come back again That's all gone It won't come back again I woke and I put on my father's shoes I stood out on the front porch like he used to do Stepped across the morning sands The skylight only showed a sign of rain Mine would be the only 
footprints that remain That's all gone Won't come back again That's all gone Won't come back again There was something I meant to say Too many words got in the way And I dreamed that it was 1962 I lit a fire on a beach and I lay in the sand with you We sang songs until the rains would come Straight across the fields we would run You wrapped your sweater around my first guitar I walked you home That's all gone won't come back again That's all gone It won't come back again There was something I meant to say Too many words got in the way yeah. And I dreamed that it was 1962 I dropped a quarter in the jukebox and I played a song for you I kissed you by the pinball king We were listening to Del Shannon sing And I had all his records, he was my favorite then well, Him and Brian Wilson, that's all gone It won't come back again That's all gone Thank you very much. When I was growing up, I used to hear all these uh, stories from my aunts and my grandmother, and my grandmother's friends. It was a wives' tale that if you happen to perish at sea while fishing um, or being on a crew of a boat, um, you would have the opportunity to come home and visit your family on the night of your death. And I heard so many stories about, you know, oh, you remember that? We all just walked in and Uncle Joe, he was sitting over there in the corner by the fireplace and then he was gone and then the next day we got the call that he died the night before. And everybody had all these stories, you know? It's one of those wives' tales that really spread around and really stuck, stuck with the culture of Newfoundland. Ron Hines did an album called Stealing Genius. It's the second time I've mentioned that album. Um, and it's 12 songs by 12 authors, um, by 12 books by 12 authors that were Ron's favorite writers, and that's why the album's called Seal and Genius. And there's one song on the record called My Father's Ghost, and I have yet to figure out which book it was from, um, but the uh, story, I'm sure, was inspired by the, uh, the uh, old wives' tale that the sailors get to come home on the night of their death. I love the language in this song. This song, uh, primarily, uh, I recorded it for the record because of one verse in particular where the imagery is just so strong. The first time I heard it, I could, I could picture every part of it. Um, so I'm going to play that song for you right now. It's called My Father's Ghost. He was sitting on the stairway. My heart filled up with dread. His hands were clenched, his clothes were drenched. I knew that he was dead. And I turned away a moment. When I looked back, he was gone. And I went and I woke my mother. Said, Mother, something's wrong, something's wrong. He was here before a moment, those were the words she spoke. I thought that I was dreaming, but it was an hour ago I woke. I swear I heard him call my name in a horrid grinding sound I fear my dear he's lost his way, his ship has run aground So 
run aground Well go down and wake your brother And your baby sister too Say nothing now of what's occurred But say I have things to do There's a shortwave radio up the cove For ship to show distress Go down and make some breakfast And I'll get up and get dressed Dawn was fairly breaking as she headed down the path where the waters crashed across the rocks with all its rage and wrath. But her heart had gone to ashes and the ice chewed through her bones. And her footsteps fell like granite as she came back home alone. Inside the doorway, and she turned towards the cove. She took down the blessed crucifix and she burned it in the stove. And we all stood in the kitchen like travelers in the rain, waiting on some distant platform to board some lonely train. My mother's in the ground My brother and sister moved away And left me the house and land And I sell my socks and sweaters To the tourists from away There's a monthly old age pension And it keeps the wolf at bay And I count the days Night comes stealing, he drifts in on the mist. He sits quietly there in his rocking chair so he won't disturb my rest. And when I wake with morning light, he's gone to see once more. Go downstairs and light the stove, mop salt water from the floor. I mop salt water from the floor. one more song and we'll take a little break. You can all refresh up on that amazing coffee or grab a bottle of water and it looks like there's some other treats back there and look around at some of this lovely art. There's something about playing in a place with all this art that's... Everything that you see took so many hours. We have no idea the hours and the labor that went into all this stuff. It's just insane. And the years that it took these people to become such craftsmen that they can actually create and build what they have. And it is awesome to play in a place like this. I've got to say, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to end this set with a bit of a sad song. Um, this is a song that I wrote for a friend of mine named Ellie Kelly. Ellie Kelly is, was an, a, uh, an Acadian accordion player who I met in Campbellford, her and her husband, Joe. And I became friends with them both. And uh, Joe got cancer, um, and uh, he had a long battle with it. I had been through it with my mother, um, and the last six weeks of my mom, uh, before my mom passed, I moved back to Newfoundland and uh, basically lived in the hospital room with her. I used to take the, the cushions off the chairs in the waiting room and set up a little bed and, and sleep in the room with her. Um, I stayed there about 22 hours a day for Almost, you know, almost six weeks. Um, and I learned during that time how, how special it is to, um, to spend, somebody with, spend time with somebody who knows that they're dying. Um, it's a very, there's an honesty that, that happens with the conversation that, 
that you don't experience with people regularly. Um, <clears throat> so when Joe got sick, I spent a lot of time with him <clears throat> as well. Uh, he lived down the road with me, and I used to go down in the afternoons, because I know how, how long and lonely those hours can be. And we used to play cards, we'd play chess, and, and inevitably, um, by the end, he, you know, read the Bible a little bit. You know, neither of us were really familiar with the Bible. We used to talk about religion. He was very concerned with whether there was an afterlife, and whether, if, if there was, whether, you know, heaven and hell were distinct, different places, and, and how he and Ellie would possibly be together again. Um, and this was a conversation we had a lot, and we never did come up with an answer. Joe passed away, and a few years later, I was still in touch with Ellie, and uh, she called me in September and said, uh, Ken, I just got back from the doctor, and I have cancer, and it's terminal. Um, they've given me till January. And I said, you know, that's horrible. We talked for a while about it, and then she said, I want to do one more record. She had uh, five records out. She wanted to do one more. She wanted to do it at my studio. She wanted me to produce it. And she wanted to um, only have friends and family involved. She didn't want professional hired musicians. She just wanted it to be sort of like a kitchen jam. So we made that record, <clears throat> and it was an honor for me to do. During the time that we were making the record, one night I, I picked up my guitar um, after she had left the studio, and I wrote a song that just came to me, uh, the entire song from start to finish. Occasionally it happens. It's very rare. Um, but I happened to be in the studio, so I pressed record because I knew the ideas were flowing, and the entire song just wrote itself. Chords, melody, lyrics, front to, front to back. Not a change was made in it. And I knew that, um, I knew that immediately that I had written this song for Ellie from her husband, Joe. And that was a perspective in songwriting that I'd never done before, is writing a song for somebody from somebody else. So after the record was done, um, Ellie was uh, still doing well in January, so I called her and said, Ellie, I said, while we were making the record, I wrote a song, and I'm pretty sure it's for you from your husband. Um, and I'm going to be demoing it next week, and I'd love you to come play some accordion on it, you know, if you feel like it. And she, she was up for it. She came down for a couple hours and laid a few accordion tracks. It was fantastic, and she loved the song. And in May, she passed away, and I was asked to speak at her funeral. And um, I agreed to do that, of course. And uh, when I showed up at the uh, funeral, home, her son told me that the last time that she played accordion was when she came to my house to uh, play on that song. And that was a really special thing to share with somebody, you know, their last uh, musical uh, experience uh, for a song that I had written for them from their deceased husband. It had so many, so many weird elements to it that it was overwhelming. Um, so I'm going to play this song tonight uh, for you guys. Uh, I'll be back for another set in a few minutes. I'm going to play this song tonight, uh, and as always, uh, this song goes out to Ellie and Joe Kelly. Goes just like this. Fairly well, fairly well. I'll see you again in heaven, or I might see you in hell. If there's nothing more when this life is through. Let it stand that I've enjoyed my time with you On golden shores we'll hold each other once again Or in the depths of hell we'll suffer through the walls of man If there's nothing more then I'll say it once again You made my life as full and bright as any man Shed no tears, don't cry no more. May you find the joy in living life as you did before. Some things will change, some will stay the same. And like a shoebox filled with letters, remember I'll remain. Please live your life each day, you know that I'll be here. Don't you surrender to the sadness and your tears We'll meet again in a place we don't yet understand Where the music's always happy like a New Orleans jazz band Just one last kiss before we part Let me hold you close and feel the beating just one last kiss on a night so blue I can't 
can't bear to spend another minute losing you. May your heart grow bright and you stay safe and warm inside. May these four walls protect you from the wind or the winds outside. When you lay your head down and it's tired and dark between your sheets, and you close your eyes and dream of the place where we might meet. Fare thee well, fare thee well. I'll see you again in heaven, or I might see you in hell. On golden shores, we'll hold each other once again. Or in the depths of hell, we'll suffer through the walls of man. If there's nothing more, then I'll say it once again. You've made my life as full and bright as any man. You've made my life as full and bright as any man. Oh, baby, you made my life. take a short break, everybody can get refreshed, and then we'll come back with some more tunes. I won't play anything that sad again. <laughs> Welcome Ken back for uh, part two of his amazing, we could, I could listen to his stories all night. <laughs> so uh, we'd like careful. to thank the province of British Columbia and Safeway for the goodies. And uh, thank you for traveling here to Dawson 3. And uh, let's hear you uh, take off with round two. Excellent, excellent. Take your time. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, no, I'm just I don't know. Still get seated here. That's all good. That's all good. I'm just getting ready. That one's a little warm. The That's signature's okay. worn off at a bit, so okay. it's mostly there. It's in the burp case, I see. Where's your water from? <laughs> Where's the water from? High River. So, 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 it says it's real Canadian. It's from High River. Is it? Yeah, it's from the biggest aquifer in the world. You know, it's funny because it tastes just like water. Yes, it's <laughs> incredible how much water comes out of this. It's real wet. Just so the calorie that comes from. Oh, I do like water. It's, it's funny, I've been, I was in Newfoundland last week this time, and I've been flying around, went back to Ontario for a bit, and then I came out here, and I've been flying and driving. I've been so dried out the last few days, I can't get enough water in me. I'm like a, I'm like a dried out sponge, I don't know what's going on, but. It's really dry up this way. Is it dry up this way? Yeah. <laughs> Some windy up this way. I noticed that today coming in from Grand Prairie. You don't have an accent. It comes out. <laughs> it comes out. When I moved, when I moved to Ontario, um, there was a, a period of time where I did actually have a job, and um, I had to be on the phone a lot. And my boss, after a couple of weeks, said to me, "You know, people are having a hard time understanding what you're saying." So I, I made a, a pretty, pretty significant. Uh, effort to slow down and start to pronounce words. So now I've ended off with this hybrid, I don't even know what kind of accent it is. But if I hear another Newfoundlander speak, I can't shut it off. I'm, I'm right back home. But if somebody says to me, you know, oh, can you talk like a Newfie? I can't do it. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Um, I was in Nashville, we go to Nashville once a year or so down there to try and sort of drum up a little bit of work, and uh, I usually come out with a couple gigs that are nice. Uh, but I was walking down Broadway uh, on one of my last trips uh, down in Nashville, and I had my, my headphones on, listening to my phone. Um, my phone, which I don't think I've ever made a phone call on. I don't even know for why I can call it a phone anymore. It does everything else for me, but um, the, um, a song came on that Ron had written, um, and uh, I knew I was gonna record it for the record. As soon as, as soon as I was listening to it and where I was, um, Ron had the luxury of, of starting um, of being a songwriter way before I was, and I feel like he stole a lot of ideas that would have been great for me. Hmm. And he definitely beat me to the punch on this one. Um, this is a song. If you get a chance to, to find the recorded version of this, the Ron Hines version of it, Ron had this big, massive smile. Um, when he was on stage, he was always smiling. When he was talking to me, he was always smiling. Um, 
and it, on the recording of this, there's one line where he did, there's one line that has his name in the line. And when he says the line, you can actually hear him smiling on the recording. It's the weirdest thing. I've never heard it with another artist before in my life. But you can hear, you can just hear the crack of his smile. It's just a beautiful thing. So I recommend checking that out. But uh, this is my version of a song called Boy from Old Pearl. And it goes like this. I've been in towns on a night off where I just, I'll just grab my guitar and walk downtown and look for a place where it doesn't look, look like the cops are going to bug me and <laughs> open my case and sit and play for a half an hour. Sometimes there's a few bucks in there, I can go get a coffee. Other times it's just a little bit of fun, you know? Um, I've never done busking as a profession. Uh, I know some people who have, and they actually make good money on it. You get in the Toronto subway system, you get one of those permits, you can make a lot of money on that. It's not really my scene, but uh, some people do really well at it. 
Ron Hines was fascinated with cowboys and uh, outlaws and soldiers. He wrote a lot of songs about soldiers, too. Um, one of the things that I learned from Ron was uh, how to switch perspective when songwriting. Uh, at one point, I was trying to write it. Me and Ron had a day off, and we watched a Bonnie and Clyde marathon. And afterwards, I, I was going back to my hotel. It was one of those A&E marathons, like all day type thing. So at the end of the day, I said, I said I'm going back to the hotel now, Ron, back to my room. So can I borrow your guitar? I'm going to go do some writing. Because I had my bass with me, because I was playing bass with him. And I always used to borrow his guitar. He said, yes, buddy. He said, what are you working on tonight? I said, I'm going to go write a song about Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> and he laughed. And he said, no, you're not. I said, yeah. He said, kind of one of those. I said, what are you talking about? He said, go on, bud. Do what you got to do. I said, OK. So I went back to the room and started strumming a few chords and writing a few words, chords, words, chords, words, fell asleep. Woke up the next day, went for a drive, got into the next hotel, and, and when I'm writing, I do a lot of research. So I thought, well, I'm gonna do some research. So I opened up the computer, typed in Bonnie and Clyde. About three hours later, I had pages of information. And I just went, oh my God, Ron was right. There's been so many poems and short stories and long stories and short films and plays and essays, and Bonnie and Clyde have been done to death. Just, there's nothing else to say about it. And Ron knew that. A few days later, we were driving, and uh, we were leaving Perth, Ontario. It was minus 40. It was a really, really bitter cold. And Ron, we were walking to the car, and we were just about to get in the car, and Ron looks across the hood at me and says, how's that Bonnie and Clyde song coming along? And he had this smirk on his face. And I looked at him, I said, you shagger. I said, you knew that, you knew that didn't you? He said, of course I did. And I said, OK. And we got in the car. And about an hour in the drive, Ron was sleeping. He always sort of stayed in the passenger side and leaned his head against the window and kind of slept. Um, and as we're driving, uh, as he's sleeping, I suddenly hear him. And he's, and he's mumbling. And then he says, stop looking at the main character. There's all kinds of people in a story, and they've all got interesting stories themselves. Turn it around and look at somebody else's perspective. And I went, what? And he was asleep. <laughs> what are you saying, Ron? <laughs> and he wouldn't look back at me. He was, he was a weird guy like that. He just left these little nuggets. Um, and I lay in bed that night, and I, I automatically, all this, Ron, all this uh, Bonnie and Clyde information I had, twisted and turned into a story about this young girl who was waitressing in a uh, diner uh, associated with a gas station on the side uh, during one of Clyde Barrow's first robberies. And she falls in love with him uh, during the robbery and watches him in the newspapers until he dies. And I wrote this whole song about this girl. And it's really, it is a Bonnie and Clyde song, but it's not about Bonnie and Clyde. So Ron taught me a lot about songwriting. I had spent a lot of time writing pop music for radio. Um, you know, I knew how to get to a chorus in under 30 seconds and how to write a hook that people could sing along to. But the idea of storytelling and actually putting a story into a song was something that was new to me when I was working with Ron. And he broadened my horizons in, in so many ways. Um, and this is one of his songs called Judgment that I really like because some people refer to it as the Jesse James song. But it's not actually Jesse James' song. It's somebody else in Jesse's life. Uh, it's a song called Judgment. And it goes like this. Every meal's a feast, 
every empress is a whore And it's better to be famous For the wrong I've done tonight Than to be nobody all my life from him to me and I got a whole world of judgment on me now oh I am cursed and called a craven coward this I will avow but I treasure my notoriety I'm the man no man wants to see still it's better to be famous for the wrong I've done co-wrote songs with a lot of people. Something I'm still learning how to do. Um, he had the opportunity to work with Murray McLaughlin on a song. <clears throat> Ron used to say that uh, he, had to meet Ron, he had to meet Murray McLaughlin uh, 8 o'clock in the morning over on the Danforth in Toronto. And Ron said it wasn't until up, up to that day when he had to get up that early that he realized it was two 8 o'clocks in a day. And he, uh, he got on the subway and transported himself over and him and Murray McLaughlin penned this song together. This is one that's really close to me too, and I think it's close to a lot of Newfoundlanders. One of the things that comes with being a Newfoundlander is the relentless awareness that when you graduate high school, you have to leave the island. There is very little in the way of work there. Um, it changes, it has changed a bit over the years, but I mean, when I was growing up, everybody I knew you know, it was when you get out of high school, you get on a plane and you go to Montreal, you go to Vancouver, you go to um, Toronto, uh, and if you were going to be working uh, sort of a, uh, a job that didn't involve going to a big city, you inevitably ended up in the oil patch somewhere. And that's, you know, hence Fort McMurray, otherwise known as Little Newfoundland. Um, it's a sad thing, but it was just something that we all grew up with. Um, some people left and stayed away for a month and then went back home and managed to find a way to stay, you know, living in Newfoundland. Um, other people stayed away for a while and then went back, and some people, like myself, managed to, uh, you know, marry outside the gene pool. You know, I found a lady from Toronto, which was great, and I, um, I married up there, and we had some kids, and I live in, uh, I've been living up there now for a long time. It's where my kids are born, it's where my family is, it's where my house is, but uh, strangely enough, uh, St. John's will always be home to me. I, I, I still can't figure out why I can't get rid of that attachment. but. Uh, this is a song that touches on some of those themes. This is uh, Ron Hines and Murray McLaughlin co-write. It goes like this. Sports on TV, 
Feeling sorry you left with no choice but to leave. There's no change in the weather, no change in me. I don't want to leave, but you can't live for free. And you can't eat the air, you can't drink the sea. No change. You shoot off a cannon from the top of Long's Hill And a Gulliver's taxi might be all you would kill We were promised the sun and the moon and the stars We got weathered old clapboard and salt-rusted cars So let me join in the leaving with all of the rest Montreal, Calgary, and Vancouver West Lay down on a sidewalk and kick off and die Watching people not looking as they hurry by There's no change in the weather, no change in me I don't want to leave, but you can't live for free and you can't eat the air, you can't drink the sea, no change in the weather, no change in me, no change in me, I don't want to leave, but you can't live for free, down here you can't live for free. No change in me. The title of the album is Good Dogs Lost. And uh, there is a there is one YouTube video in existence that uh, where Ron tells the story of a good dog is lost. I made an agreement with myself that I could talk about my experiences with Ron, uh, my how Ron impacted on me and my songwriting. Um, and how his song right and how his songs impacted me, but I would never tell Ron's stories. Ron had stories just like I do, and he told all these crazy, beautiful stories before each of his songs. Um, and I agreed to myself that I would never tell those stories. Um, the story of a good dog is lost. There is one video on YouTube. It's not a particularly well shot video. It's a phone, sort of somebody in an audience, but it's Ron's it's about a six or seven minute story that introduces this song, and it's really worth looking up. The song is beautiful, um, and the gist of the song was that um, Kathy Jones had lost her little white dog, and Ron and a bunch of people in the community were looking for it, and when Ron came home, his daughter, Lily, was sitting down with a piece of paper and some crayons, and she drew this sort of stick figure dog and written, a good dog is lost across the top, and with a phone number, please call. And she said, you know, she said, Dad, Daddy, like, you know, let's use this to see if we can help find the dog. And Ron looked at it immediately and went, okay, that's a song. <laughs> and he wrote a beautiful song about it called A Good Dog is Lost, and it is the title of the album. Uh, the album's out November 6th, but I have some copies with me tonight if anybody's interested in picking it up. Uh, it's a full band on it. It's a really nice record. 
um, and look up the uh, video for this one because uh, it is an interesting story, uh, and Ron tells it. Ron tells it really well. Hmm? They find the dog. This isn't a particularly sad story because they find the dog. <laughs> Good dog is lost, sit aside above the counter at the corner store, with an address and a phone to call. Still in all it said, a little bit more it said, hey the stranger, I can hardly believe someone that I love that much has run away from me, and if you find her. You can only return to me at any cost For a good dog is lost Somewhere out there tonight upon a darkened street Running breathless with a wild beaten heart In all directions on four tiny feet calling Hey there stranger, well I can hardly be Someone that I love that much has forgotten about me. Look at all these people tucked away in their houses, watching reruns of Who's the Boss? Or a good dog is lost. And a tired clerk behind the counter says, Every day in tiny ways we disappear. A night like this. Better him than me out there Where a good dog is lost So to fly beneath the windshield Wipe her up my car So I stashed it in my groceries Caught this expression in my rearview mirror It said, hey there stranger well, I can hardly believe That a picture of a puppy drawn crayon can get to a guy like me guess I'll just go out and drive around you know I'll never sleep I'll just turn and toss for a good dog is lost a good dog is Thank you very much. Time for three more, I think. <coughs> St. John's Waltz. Newfoundlanders like to drink. Um, I'm not sure why, but um, I don't know. Maybe I was just told that early in my life and it just became something that I had to do my part in as well. <laughs> I like that. Um, this is a song called the St. John's Waltz that is a bit of an anthem back home. Um, and on the record, I reached out to Paul Kinsman, who plays accordion and keyboards, and he used to play with Ron. And he had some accordion to the track. And uh, another friend of mine, a lady by the name of Amelia Curran, who's uh, got a, this beautiful, lovely, haunting voice. Um, she's a little bit of a, uh, a diamond of Newfoundland. And I, I, I love, uh, I love listening to her sing and I was really, really happy when she agreed to sing this song as a duet with me. So I actually have a hard time singing this one because the second verse, I'm so used to hearing her sing it now. And she does such a lovely job and I can't even compare. But I'm going to play it anyways. Um, this song, I don't think it's about drinking. I never asked wrong about the song, but there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of references to getting drunk in St. John's, Newfoundland and experiencing the St. John's Waltz. It goes just like this. And the evening still in dark And the 
seagulls all are dreaming Seagull dreams on Amherst Rock And the mist is slowly moving As the storefront lights go dim And the moon is gently lifting As the last ship's coming in And the sailors got a story some are true and some are false But they're always erect and they're up on the decks And they're dancing in the St. John's Waltz We've had our share of history We've seen nations come and go We've seen battles rage over land and stage Four hundred years or more for beauty or for freedom for country or for king or for money or fame but there are no names on the graves where men lie sleeping in the nine to five survive the day with a sigh and a dose of salts and their park and their cars in the packet in the bars and the dance in the St. John's Waltz Oh, my heart is on and I'm sold on going to sea All the planes fill up the skyway And the trains run swift and free Leave the wayward free to wander Leave the restless free to roam Whether it's rocks in the bay Or an old cliche You'll find your way back home don't question or inquire what's been gained or what's been lost In a world of romance, don't miss out on the chance to be dancing the St. John's Wall such a bad salesman. I hate, I hate, I hate selling stuff. But I have CDs. I have both the new album and the old album. I have vinyl. I have some shirts. I have some stickers. I have some hats. I've got everything. It's all over there. If you want, to, we can talk about it after. Just, I have to write it on the CD. I keep forgetting. Every night I get off. I didn't mention anything. It does help us artists do what we're doing. It really does. And we appreciate it all. It's really nice for you guys to come out tonight. I'm going to play a song, one more of my songs, and then one more of Ron's. My wife, I say about my wife, she's one of the most amazing women. We've been together for 27 years now. We have two daughters, 19 and 17. Um, we have a little house in Campbellford. We've got a couple dogs and a lizard and a cat that I never really see. Um, we've got a pretty good life, and I have no bloody idea how she put up with me. Um, I spent, you know, the better part of, uh, you know, like I said, 250, 280 shows a year for almost 25 years being away from her. Um, and we have this amazing relationship. We're polar opposites. She doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't get high. Um, she doesn't have a music collection. She has certain stuff she likes, but she gets in the car and she turns it on and whatever's playing on the radio is just fine. I, that drives me bloody crazy. I can't do that. I, music is so important. <laughs> She's a school teacher and she loves teaching. Her passion for teaching is the same as my passion for music. She will go out of her way to do it. And she's, she's an overachiever. She's super organized. We're, we're so far apart. Um, but somehow we work together magically and we've come over. We, we've been through great times and bad times. Um, a few years ago, she was diagnosed with MS, which is a really hard thing to deal with. Uh, I had to take a couple years off. This month and this tour and, and what I did just before this and what I'm doing after is the first time I'm sort of back on the road now that we've got the house remodeled so that she can get through it, you know, without having to deal with stairs and we've redone the bathroom and all that crap that you have to do when you're dealing with an illness. Um, 
and we get through all this and somehow, you know, even on the bad days when she gets out of bed and, and you know, she gets a shower and she calls me, she's like, I'm, not, I'm done, that's it for the day, you know, which is the way MS works sometimes. You know, we go and we sit on the couch and I'm like, okay, this is great, I can smoke a joint and play guitar and watch movies all day and she just sits there and it's, we somehow get through all this stuff together and she's so supportive and it's just a fantastic thing. And being a musician, I'm a, I'm a night, I'm a sort of a night guy um, and I spend, my, when I'm writing, I'm up all night writing. And uh, she knows everything that's happening in my life so I don't need to tell her the stories behind the songs because she knows what I'm writing about. And uh, oftentimes when her alarm goes off in the morning to uh, go to school, I'm sitting at the edge of the bed, you know, I'm after finishing a song, and I'm like, I got a song written, you know, you know what's happening with such and such, I wrote this song about it, and she's like, oh, that's awesome. When I was writing No Dark, No Light, we were in bed one night, we were watching TV and hanging out, and, and she sort of turned to me out of the blue, and she said, why have you never written a song for me? <laughs> and I went, oh, damn. I said, ah, okay, you caught me. And, because she's in all the music somehow, but she was right, I've never sort of written her a song. So that night, I, uh, after she went to sleep, I went downstairs and I spent all night writing. And when she got up in the morning, I was sitting at the edge of the bed and I said, I've finally done it. Here's your song. <laughs> and I, uh, I played this song for her. Falls, I've seen the best and I've seen them all at days and nothing more beautiful to see. You ring your hair and you drape your clothes, the sunlight's your silhouette shape exposed, it's clear. You bring it out the best in me. Why you wanna waste your time with Why you want to waste your time with me? Morning breaks, I haven't slept all night The sunlight warms to your skin's delight I'm dying just to sit here and watch you breathe Pressed to your chest lies a mother's joy He dreams little dreams of a little boy This feels like a luck I can't believe Why you wanna waste your time with me? Why you wanna waste your time with me? On the album is a mandolin solo here Played by Mr. Luke Mercier It's my favorite part of the whole record I play this song, I hear it ringing through my head. I know you guys can't hear it, but it's happening, believe me. It's coming to the end, here we go. Now it's been 10 years, or maybe 12, and we've had some times that have felt like hell, but you held your ground and you stayed strong and true for me. In the good times far outweigh the bad And the happiness outweighs the sad There's just one question here my friends agree Why you wanna waste your time with me? Why you wanna waste your time with me? They've grown and gone And all I can do is sing this song In a voice that cracks A melody carefree On the porch we sit as the sun fades away We wave to the neighbors across the way I still can't believe you did all this with me And you say Do you want to waste some time with me? Do you want to waste some time with me? Do you want to 
waste some time with me? Do you want to waste some time with me? Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to end tonight with Ron's song. Um, as songwriters, we go through life writing songs, making records, hoping people will listen to them. Will be maybe something to be played on the radio. And every now and again, something clicks, and you have that song that generates enough interest in what you're doing that it allows you to continue for another year or another five years, or sometimes for an entire life. Uh, Ron had one of those songs. He had several others that kind of followed closely, but he had one song in particular that allowed him to play music and create music until he died. He played the last show a couple weeks before he died, actually, the week before he died. I used to drive down, I remember driving down the highway with him, and he turned to me at one point and saying, yeah, if you look over and I'm dead, just pull over and roll me into the ditch. That's where I've been spending all my time. It's just, you know, that's what happens with some of us songwriters that just spend a lifetime playing music. Um, this song has been recorded by 200 plus artists around the world. Uh, Mary Black, uh, Emilio Harris, uh, all kinds of people have recorded it. And if you go to Ireland, if you go into any of the Irish pubs, you will find them playing this song as part of the Irish repertoire. And they actually sent Ron over at one point with a small film crew and they used to go into the clubs and they'd be playing this song and Ron would go up and say, tell me about that song you were playing. And they'd give them this huge history of Irish legend of where this song came from. <laughs> the Irish think it's an Irish traditional song. They think they have an ownership of it, but it was actually written by Ron Hines from St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, I love playing this song. It's a dream come true that I got to play it with the man himself. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know there was a lot of other choices of things to do with the two other music things going on. Plus, Netflix is always hard to get away from. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I also know how hard it is to sit for two hours and listen to some guy you've never seen before play a bunch of songs you've never heard before. Uh, so thank you all for coming out. Sunny Lee. On a farm in a wide open space, you can kick off your shoes, you can give up the race, you can lay down your head by a sweet river bed. And Sonny always remembers what it was his mama said. Sonny, don't.
sailor who never comes home And these nights get so long And the silence goes on And I'm feeling so tired I'm not all that strong coming and don't forget to buy CDs and t-shirts maybe a vinyl our next home route concert is Sunday November 18th we can start the week off perfect on a Sunday evening we're featuring Woody Holler from Manitoba and he's a country western singer and there is tickets available at the desk thank you very much everyone for coming and have a fabulous night thank you.